You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. We've been talking about one particular Christian, one that I knew very well. He happened to be my first husband, Jim Elliott. His life bore the stamp of Christ. I want to tell you a little of my own first impressions of Jim Elliott. He and I both went to Wheaton College, a small liberal arts college west of Chicago. I was one year ahead of him. He was in my brother Dave's class. And Dave Howard used to say to me, you got to meet this guy, Elliot. you got to meet this guy, Elliot. I mean, he's terrific. You'd like him. Well, Dave's my little brother. I wasn't all that excited about meeting my little brother's friends. But I have to confess that I did sort of begin to notice Jim Elliot around the campus. I liked Jim Elliot's smile. He had beautiful, white, very even teeth, and he smiled from ear to ear. I used to notice that he stood in dining hall lines with little white cards in his hand. I was curious as to what those cards were and found out from somebody else, not that I spoke to Jim, that they were either navigator scripture memory cards that he was memorizing or Greek verbs. He had the English on one side of the card and the Greek verb on the other, and he would get other kids that were standing in the line to drill him. He had a forthright way about him that I liked. He spoke up. He spoke out with vigor and humor. I liked his sense of humor. He was a campus clown. Well, those were some of my first impressions. They were not of a great spiritual giant. I didn't think of him particularly as living in the shadow of the Almighty or bearing the stamp of Christ. These phrases may sound a little bit high-flown, referring to a college man. And yet, and yet, well, we'll talk about that later. Let me give you some of his background. His ancestors came from Scotland. They immigrated to Ontario, Canada, and then to Saskatchewan, and then to British Columbia. His father was born in Alberta, and when he was a young man, he began to travel with an older man, a preacher by the name of Harry Ironside, who was a traveling preacher out there in the West, and he took the young Fred Elliott with him as he was traveling. Then, to leave the Elliott side for a moment, let me go back to Bern, Switzerland. There was a young man in Bern who was the son of the civil engineer of that city, and he came to the United States and homesteaded in the state of Washington. There he married a ribbon maker's daughter and built for himself a beautiful oasis in that very desolate, dry grass country of eastern Washington. They raised sheep, and their daughter, Clara, who was in love with her father's foreman, happened to be there one day when a traveling preacher came along with a younger preacher with him. It was Harry Ironside and Fred Elliott. Fred Elliott noticed Clara Lugenbuehl. He noticed particularly that she was with a young man on Monday night. On Tuesday night, when he went to the meeting where he and Harry were preaching, he noticed that Clara was there with a different young man. Eagerly, he looked for her in the audience on Wednesday night, and guess what? Clara was there with a third young man. So this gave Fred the courage to believe that maybe she would be willing to go out on Thursday night with number four. So he had the courage to ask her for a date, took her out on Thursday night, and eventually they were married. Clara went into chiropractic college and graduated as a chiropractor, Fred became a traveling preacher and evangelist, and they had four children. They lived in Portland, Oregon. Their third child was named Jim. He was born in 1927. He went to grade school in Portland and then to Benson Polytechnic High School, where he majored in architectural drawing. He was an orator in high school. He was also thought of as being very handsome and also very peculiar. He used to carry a Bible on top of his textbooks. It was his ambition to be President of the United States, and it was not difficult for his classmates to believe that he really might make it. He was one of those outspoken, forthright people that had a certain charisma of personality, 
and the ability to stand up and speak at a moment's notice. One day he was out hunting with his friend Fisher, and as Fisher was climbing through a wire fence, his gun went off accidentally, and the bullet went through Jim's hair. Jim's older brother, Bert, started a garbage business in Portland. Back in those days, it was a private business to collect the garbage, and so they had a big old truck, and Bert drove the truck, and Jim rode on top of the garbage, sometimes swatting at the seagulls with sticks or maybe fluorescent tubes that he found in people's trash. They were a sight as they went roaring down the street. Then, besides being a garbage man and a hunter and an orator, a hopeful architect, he was a poet. He liked to write poetry and he liked to read poetry. He went to Wheaton College in 1945 with two goals. One was to get a Bachelor of Arts and the other was to get a degree called AUG, Approved Unto God. He wanted to be a soldier. He wanted to be under his commanding officer, whom he had chosen, Jesus Christ. One of his favorite scripture verses was 2 Timothy 2.4. A soldier on active service does not become entangled in civilian affairs. He must be wholly at his commanding officer's disposal. Jim Elliot had made a final choice. Jesus Christ was Lord of his life. I meet a lot of young college students who don't seem to have any very well-defined aims at all. If I ask them, what do you live for, sometimes I get a blank stare. One of the ways in which Jim pursued his aim of being approved unto God was to get up an hour earlier than he would have each day in order to have time to read his Bible and pray. In a letter to his 15-year-old sister Jane, Jim wrote this, Begin each day with private reading of the word and prayer. Bunyan has well said, Sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. From the very first, as you begin high school, give out gospel tracts to those you meet. Make a bold start. It's easier that way rather than trying to begin halfway through. Memorize scripture on the streetcar. Buy up the time. It's costly because it's fleeting. These are terse remarks and trite, but I wish someone had said them to me about Labor Day, 1941. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. He set his alarm every night to waken him in time for prayer and study of the Bible. None of it gets to be old stuff, he wrote, for it is Christ in print, the living word, We wouldn't think of rising in the morning without a face wash, but we often neglect that purgative cleansing of the word of the Lord. It wakes us up to our responsibility. When he was a junior, he was invited to be business manager of the Tower, which was the college yearbook. This is what he wrote in his diary. They've asked me to take over the position of business manager next year. It would mean that I would get six grade points, free tuition for a year, and a $12,000 responsibility. But it would also mean late hours, a reduced class schedule, and participation in a lot of formal foolishness, which I find difficult to reconcile with my nonconformist attitudes. He rejected the offer, his family protested, and he wrote to them, Your letter arrived too late to dissuade me from my decision regarding the post on the Tower staff. Last weekend, I was quite upset about the whole matter, but after a long session of prayer, my mind became settled, and I found peace in believing that it was not the Lord's will that I take it. Yet I still cannot set down reasons for the decision, save this, that the Lord showed the psalmist the path of life, evidently by his simply lingering in his presence. Psalm 16:11. I waited on him, and somehow the answer came. I trust it was of the Spirit." A man's heart deviseth his way, said Solomon, but the Lord directeth his steps. My heart has devised to serve him. I must leave the next step to him. Sometimes in the preparation of a young soul who commits himself to serve the Lord, 
God seems to find it necessary to narrow that one's vision until it is clearly focused. Christians are often accused of being very narrow. Perhaps the explanation is that our vision is more clearly focused, more narrowly focused than that of a good many other people. Jim had a praying father, and I'm sure that that accounts for some of his spiritual success. He wrote to his father, I have felt the impact of your prayers in these past weeks. I am certain now that nothing has had a more powerful influence in this life of mine than your prayers. I was thinking today, Dad, how you used to read Proverbs to us. I can't remember much of what you read in the breakfast nook, but I find that the experience has left in my mind a profound respect and love for the old wise man's words. Thank God you took the time. The value of such is inestimable. The making of a Christian. Godly parents, prayer, giving the Bible its place, clarifying your aims, setting your face like a flint to do the will of God. Gateway to Joy 102, the making of a Christian.